that I get the great pleasure of introducing a dear friend uh, to help me on my odyssey into crypto. I was loving him in 2021, hating him in 2022, but I'm loving him again right now. <laughs> so this is a love fest for me and Jeremy, but uh, I'd like Jeremy to talk a little bit about, obviously everyone knows who Jeremy is, so I'm not going to make a big formal introduction, but I, I want Jeremy to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you've just launched, some of the things you're just announcing. Um, as you guys probably know, Jeremy's in the quiet period related to the IPO, so we're not going to discuss the IPO, but we're going to discuss the business more broadly and discuss the uh, world of stable coins, but also the world of uh, cryptocurrencies in general. But just tell us, give us a little update on what we were talking about backstage. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. For, uh, thanks for hosting. Loving you again. I'm loving you again, Jeremy. <laughs> so, I don't think you ever. Stopped. John, that voodoo yeah. doll of Jeremy. You can put it away now. No, <laughs> he was very helpful to get me into the industry, so I'm very grateful to him. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, literally just a, an hour or two ago, uh, we we launched something which is called the State of the USDC Economy 2024, and it's in in some ways it's sort of the annual report on USDC, and we, we're sort of looking at uh, looking at last year, looking at the, what's what's changing, and and certainly looking forward. And uh, I will uh, let you all kind of take a look at it. There's a lot online about it, and and I would encourage you to do that. But I think there's some big themes that are there. Um, you know, w w one big theme is you know, USDC, um, despite facing incredible you know, macro issues, banking crises, other things, has continued to operate as the largest regulated dollar stable coin in the world. And you know, a lot of people focus on things like you know, transparency. Um, USDC has you know, its reserves managed in the top financial institutions in the world with daily transparency. Uh, and you know, people worry about can you redeem uh, a, a, a digital a dollar, et cetera. And we handled $197 billion of creations, min mints and redemptions last year, which is a huge scale. And we report that, by the way, every single week. We report exactly what those volumes are. And so the most liquid, the most accessible in the world. But some of the other things that we, uh, that we talked about is the, the, the use of stable coins is evolving a lot. And um, w we actually published for the first time a whole set of data on the non-speculative uses of different types of, uh, of dollars. And what we've, actually, what we've actually produced is that USDC has the least amount of speculative use compared to almost any other form of electronic dollar, including ACH money, <laughs> wire money, and, and other stable coins. And so that's significant. When we think about uh, the, the utility value phase of this whole market, you know, what is useful to people? And so we've started to see you know, major payments companies, uh, major international aid organizations, major remittance companies, um, launching products that are building on this. And so the narrative around, uh, you know, to quote uh, uh, a, a well-known regulator that stablecoins are merely poker chips in a crypto casino um, to a, a world where these are increasingly being adopted internationally in emerging markets. Um, we saw 60% growth year over year in the number of people holding kind of meaningful wallets using USDC in a year where there was, you know, backtracking and a lot of other things. So um, th there's a lot that's happening there. And I think um, the theme, and, and this is a theme for the whole industry, is um, despite what we're, what, you know, have been a, a variety of different types of headwinds, the progress on this space has been persistent. And so when we look forward, we can talk about, you know, what we're seeing going forward. Um, you know, a lot is lining up uh, to make, uh, you know, stable coins, you know, they may already be the killer app of blockchains, but decisively the killer app uh, of this technology, uh, you know, going forward. I, I want to take it back, but I, before I do that, I want to follow up a little bit on the regulatory landscape. Uh, Jeremy said something to me, you know, I, when I'm having a bad day, I watch Honey Badger YouTubes. <laughs> you should do that, okay? Because the Honey Badger does not give a shit, in case you didn't know, okay? And Honey Badger will eat through anything. And Jeremy said something interesting before we got on stage, that Bitcoin is the Honey Badger, right? It just doesn't care. Uh, but in many ways, circles the Honey Badger. I give you a tremendous amount of credit, 10, 12-year odyssey of building in ups and down cycles, and dealing with U.S. regulation. And so 
to the extent that you're willing to talk about it, tell us your framework of discussion and communication and what is the ethos of cir circle? Yeah. Because when I hear the word circle, I hear integrity and the blockchain, integrity mm -hmm. and stable coins. And I think you've done a very good job of resonating that, but give us the ethos. Sure. I mean, it goes back to the founding of the company, which is that in, in early 2013, there were no regulations on anything. And now there's a myth out there, there's a, maybe a myth-busting moment, which is that you know, people say, well, the U.S. is slow to regulate or this or that and, and so on. But what people forget is that the United States government was the very first government in the world to regulate this industry in 2013 before any other major government in the world. And that was through the U.S. Treasury Department. The U.S. Treasury Department said, look, this is a legitimate form of asset, and if you're going to exchange real money or fiat money or you're going to interface with the financial system and you're going to do that with virtual assets, uh, virtual currencies as they called them back then, then you need to be regulated under the same framework that regulates uh, uh, banks, broker dealers, financial institutions. And so that set the course for a, a pathway where you could actually build a regula regulatory compliant business, which we did. So we were the very first company to receive money transmission licenses in every state that required them. We were the very first company to receive what's called the BIT license in New York. And we were the only company with a BIT license for an entire year. We were the very first company to receive an e-money issuer license in our industry in, in the European Union. And so we set out to, you know, really the vision was how do we integrate the traditional financial system and the fiat system with public blockchain infrastructure. And the only way to do that was by doing it in a compliant way and walking in through the front door of policymakers, telling everybody what you're gonna do, how you're gonna do it, how you're managing risks, et cetera. So that was the ethos that we set out. And you know that's allowed us to partner with the biggest financial institutions in the world for our infrastructure. It's allowed us to do a lot of different things and have great investors like BlackRock and Fidelity and others. But I think um, trust, transparency, uh, you know, kind of compliance, those have been kind of key pieces. And I think there are absolutely, you know, parts of, of this whole uh, ecosystem that, you know, are saying, well, that what's the whole point? The whole point is we're trying to do something that's outside of the traditional financial system. We, we, we're a little bit of a, uh, uh, an anomaly. We're not all about, you know, there's a new global digital reserve currency. We're, we're in this kind of hybrid uh, world. And, and so that's just been part of who we are and how we've built the company from 11 years ago when we really started. Well, I, the reason I'm asking the question, I want people to really get the ethos of what you're doing because the world is changing and these assets, these digital pieces of property are mainstreaming. Yeah. And so, like it or not, the libertarians in the room, and some of us are from the Wild West, but like it or not, we have to accept some level of process and, and regulation. I wanna step back for a second, set the scene. It's about two years ago, I'm on the island, the Almarian Island. Is that where the Four Seasons is? Almarian Island. Almarian Island. And I'm, I'm in the lobby in uh, Abu Dhabi, and I run into Larry Fink, a mutual friend of ours. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, Bitcoin is garbage. Bitcoin <laughs> is garbage. But I love Circle. I've made a very big investment in Jeremy Allaire's company. Now, I also had that revelation that Bitcoin was garbage back in 2017 when I first looked at it. <laughs> and But Larry decided, as did I, that Bitcoin is not garbage. And so I have a thesis. I want to run it by you and sure. get your reaction to it. I think the more research that you do on Bitcoin and the deeper dive that you do, it's a one-way ticket towards Bitcoin. I don't know too many people that do the actual homework, Jeremy, and say, oh, this is terrible. People who say it's terrible typically— Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff. You think he's actually done the homework? Though? No, I don't know. No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> no, because I asked him, he has no idea. He's never read the white paper. He's never just decided that it's uh, uh, arithm arithmetic blather, I think he calls it. But tell me about how an enlightened person, an institutionalist, goes from not liking it to liking it. What? Because you've seen many of these people do this. What is the thought process? What goes on? How do people make this transition? And by the way, it takes a big person to do it because you're originally saying it's not good mm. and then you're running towards it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think um, uh, the, the, 
the big thing I think is that I think when people really forget about the technology for a minute, because I, I, I think that's actually a vital piece of this. But as everyone knows, right, anyone can take the Bitcoin code base and clone it and launch whatever Dogecoin <laughs> right. or, 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 or what have you. And so, um, you know, obviously the open source nature of it is a very powerful component of it. But I actually think that the, the, the big factor is that the world people realize that we're in a very complex world and in and we're in a very complex international political economy and a very complex international monetary situation and people understand that the world uh that that governments have immense amounts of debt uh and that the the kind of the stability of the debt-backed uh fiat system is not a foregone conclusion and i think they see that playing out over and over again in lots of different parts of the world. And so there's just a fact on the ground. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's hard to debate. And I, I, I think um, then the question becomes as well, everyone should just, you know, consolidate around the world's reserve currency or, or something like that. And <coughs> I think when people really look into it, they realize that actually it's a helpful thing to have a non-sovereign form of, of value in the world that a non-sovereign form of value is a is something to to cherish to foster to uphold because we have no idea what the global political economy is going to be in 10 years and that's playing out right here this week i mean if you look at the the issues on the table in terms of the the international uh economic political military structure all these things and so yeah. i think and take someone like larry fink and i had the benefit of being able to spend time with him and, and share my views on digital commodity money and why I thought that was something that was here to stay. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if you are, if you have a global macro view and you look at the, th that complexity in the world, then you realize actually it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have that. And then you ask yourself, well, what is the, what's the best way to have that? Is it a, is it an ancient metal or is it, you know, is there a way to do this in a digital way? Is there a way to do this, that is I in line with the incredible uh, advancements that have occurred with the internet and cryptography and uh, and and you know, software technology and clearly like humans are tool makers uh, until the machines outdo us uh, but but humans are tool makers and uh, and and money has always been a tool making exercise and so this is just m you know I think a contemporary kind of tool making. And so you look at that and say, okay, this is human ingenuity, this is tool making, and you look at that kind of global, uh, political, economic, monetary, you know, set of issues, and and I think then, it's it's very easy to say, of course, this makes sense. Can we give you credit for turning, Larry? I have no idea when he when he sort of officially uh, 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 turn, turned turned uh, turned um, on that, but I certainly tried to convey my thoughts to the leadership at BlackRock. I think. Um, Noteworthy, though, is last week uh, on the on the back of the you know the announcement of of the launch of IBIT and Bitcoin ETFs. You know what he's really now talking about is tokenization. How do we apply this and and take this technology? And it's not just about the Bitcoin token. It's about how do you apply this technology most broadly? And I think what what oftentimes people don't r remember is that the most you know the most widely used regulated tokenized asset is actually USDC, tokenized cash. And so we have applications of tokenization today that are incredibly successful and people want to use those. And obviously we, we need to evolve that to many, many other, uh, many, many other types of not just financial instruments, but other uses of digital tokens um, in e economic systems and in governance systems and in um, data sharing systems and other things. When I when I walk into a restaurant and take out my smartphone and I pay the waiter with USDC and I avoid MasterCard and Visa and American Express, what year am I in? Am I in 2025, 27? Well, it's, a real, it's really, it's a great question. We, and we, um, we touch on these themes in the State of the USDC Economy Report this year. So something that's really interesting that's happening is um, you know, there's, there's the chicken and the egg, <laughs> right? 
So what's the chicken and the egg in this scenario, right? Um, in some places, you're seeing um, on the ground viral adoption of stable coins because it's a better form of money for those individuals or for those businesses and those SMEs. And, and that's happening principally in emerging markets around the world. But there's something else that's following that, which is you're seeing companies that are at the forefront of providing digital services to end users in the world. So companies like Grab in Southeast Asia that has 200 million users, companies like Nubank in Brazil that has 90 million users. These are companies that are building Web3 wallets and building stable coins like USDC into their products. Now, this is the chicken and egg question. If you just show up to a merchant and you say, hey, I've got a new medium of exchange, it's a payment method where you can have direct instant settlement with no fees, it's an irreversible transaction, and you can do it from anyone who has an internet device in the world or a machine or anything can pay you, they go, that's amazing. And I've talked to a lot of CFOs of very large companies that have literally half a billion dollars to a billion dollars of interchange fees they pay a year mm -hmm. and and they say yeah. i want this but the, the the chicken and the egg is you need you need large wallets you need large consumer platforms that embrace this technology and it's sort of like in the early days of the internet if i uh you know and i went through this in different areas of the internet i i had an online video platform company before circle and you know, I was out talking to all the content creators about how you could have direct to consumer content and you could bypass the TV networks and you could bypass all these things and go directly. And they were like, that sounds great, but where's all the users? It took broadband and it took basically the ability for people to have a consistent way to play back video on devices. Once you had that, then you had over the top media distribution and you had the Netflixes of the world just went through escape velocity. And, and you had that with the earlier incarnations of the internet. Well, what's that moment? What would be the So, all right, I, I was giving a long-winded answer no, 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 to no, your I more straightforward question, which is what year. So um, I don't think it's this year, um, but I believe that the, uh, the there's a couple key things that are needed. One is that we need legal certainty that stable coins are cash equivalent in the, in the real financial system. A CFO of a major company is not gonna take payment in something that is not actually, cannot actually be considered a cash equivalent. They're not. And so there may be cutting edge companies that do it and others. And so what does legal certainty mean? That means that you have stablecoin laws on the books in every major financial market in the world. And guess what? That's what's happening in 2024. Japan on the books, EU, on the books, going effective very shortly. Hong Kong, Singapore, UAE, the United Kingdom, and God willing, the United States. But all of these jurisdictions have, are codifying that, that properly established and compliant payment stable coins will be treated as equivalent forms of money. When you have that, then the floodgates can open. You also need the technological progress. You need you know, blockchain infrastructure that can support it. And we're seeing that today. We're seeing that today, uh, and we're seeing the abstractions that make it possible for users to basically transact directly without even knowing what blockchain they're using, without even knowing what, you know, they don't need to know what gas fees are. And uh, this is being abstracted away, so you can have direct payment experiences that are as good or better than anything else. So the user experience problem and the infrastructure problem combined with legal certainty, when you have those two things, and then you get these big consumer aggregators building it, then all of a sudden I can see a world by the end of 2025 where there's a billion individuals that have digital wallets that can transact in USDC. When you have a billion people who can transact in USDC, then it's a no-brainer for a business to say, I'm adding this as a payment method because all of a sudden that's 2x the number of PayPal users or 3x the number of others. And so at that point, it becomes a no-brainer for people to start accepting it. Okay, there, there was one key phrase that you used, which was God willing, <laughs> in reference to the United States, my favorite country and my hometown. And so what would you say to the congressional delegation here or people, men and women of the Congress, what is it that they're missing when someone like Elizabeth Warren is saying certain things or others? 
what is it that they're missing? How do we break through to them from the frozen mind that they have now related to some of the stuff on Web3? What sure. Would, how would you get them? What would be the epiphany creation? I think there's a few things. I, I think the first is that um, uh, what our political leaders need to understand is that um, there is a contest over the future of currency on the internet. And that is, that is a contest and a competition that is happening, and it's happening today. And today, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. And you cannot take that for granted. The United States should not take that for granted because people will have other choices. Other governments will organize alternative payment systems. If the United States wants the dollar to be the competitive currency of the internet, then they need to establish a framework for the dollar to compete on the internet. And the way to do that is by building strong national regulations around digital dollars to provide legal certainty around their use and to unleash a competitive free market and a regulated competitive free market that can innovate at the technology level. The government's not gonna build this technology. They're gonna do it, it'll take them five or 10 years. The private sector's already done it. And so the reference currency of blockchains is already dollars. And so there's an opportunity to seize that. I think the other thing I would say is right now, the, the US government is allowing other governments to define the rules for how dollars on the internet work. All those other jurisdictions I just talked about, and they're all great jurisdictions, and we work with all of those as well. Um, all of those other jurisdictions are defining how these digital dollars are gonna work, and the, you know, that's, that's embarrassing for the United States. So one, this is about national competitive economic interests. It's about foreign policy, sovereignty. It's also about uh, uh, you know, you know, leadership. And the last thing is, is that what the last thing that the US government wants is for a kind of counterfeit digital dollar that is outside of the reach of the US government, that is impervious to the US government's national security and other interests to be operating in the dark. And there's a major piece in the FT today talking about this research from the UN about how that kind of alternative is being used. And so if Senator Warren, who's my home district senator, um, uh, Senator Warren, if she is focused on, you know, how, how do you deal? She, she wants to focus on the illicit uses of this. And I think that's a very, very fair thing. And I, I don't buy the argument from a lot of people in the crypto community that look at how bad the banking industry is. Look, you know, there's not a problem over here. I don't buy that because if you talk to anyone broadly, there's a real growth in, in criminal abuse of this technology. You just need to look at that straight on and, and answer that. But if you want to address that and you want to address that issue, put in place rules um, that provide a way for good actors to be able to scale and grow and operate and, and as opposed to sort of hope it goes away or try and regulate it out of, out of existence because that is clearly not going to happen. If, you, if you're not comfortable answering this, we'll go to the next question. But what do, you, what do you think the resistance point is with someone like a Senator Warren or some of the naysayers in terms of like, so you just laid out a footprint where we are and we have been consistently a leader in the world of financial services, the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, and yet we're willing to cede this to other countries due to this blockage. Is this, is this not to be overly cynical, but is this somebody lobbying these people, telling them not to do it? Is it, is it a lack of awareness of what's going around, around the world? What is the obstacle or the blockage here? Well, I mean, the the, the 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 reality is you know there are there have been a lot of problems in this industry and so it's it's not like uh, a congressperson shouldn't look at it and say there's a lot of problems here i mean you've had fraudsters you've had criminals you've had abuse you've had how many countries go bankrupt over w what have been ponzi schemes you've, you've you've had a lot of problems and so that's fair and so uh, for for people who are looking <laughs> looking at problems that's there I think the challenge has been is, um, you know, uh, uh, effectively, and I, and I know Senator Warren, and I think is what's interesting about Senator Warren is that, you know, for a very long time, she's the senator who's <coughs> most associated with taking on the big banks. She's the senator who's most associated with, you know, post-financial crisis. W you know, she set up the CFPB 
as a way to provide greater consumer protection about the abuses of the banking system. She cares about financial inclusion. She cares about are we building a better, safer uh, financial system? How do we deal with – she's been a, a, a senator who's been focused on the predatory pricing of different financial products, including the card schemes, other things. So – Actually, there's a lot of alignment, and I think it's, it's, it's that, that alignment is there. And so I do think it's a question of time and education <laughs> and putting in, the, putting in the effort, because I think when you do that, um, then I think policymakers actually understand that, no, actually, we need, to have, we need to have clear regulations, and if we have those, then this actually can thrive and responsible innovation can thrive, and that can actually lead to – exactly the kinds of better outcomes that are actually at the, at the core of, in some ways, the progressive agenda. So I actually think there's a way there. Okay, so I, I called her part of the regulatory access of evil <laughs> last week. Was that, was that bad? Should I take that back? So I, just, you know, I think we have different PR strategies. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You're going public, and I'll remain private forever. <laughs> <laughs> Got to throw that in there.